It's the Celebrity Master Chef Finals, and only the four best cooks remain. I have made it to the finals. How ridiculous is that? Very. So, buckle up. It's going to be a bumpy ride. I now just kind of say to myself every time I go in the kitchen, like, it never gets easier. Like, it is going to be tough, but just do it. Four of us left. Be nice to win. It would be. I love a trophy. I think it comes down to a battle of wits and who can hang on the longest. Do you know what? I've got a pretty strong grip. Tonight, the pressure intensifies. I mean, it is seriously bang on perfect. Incredible. Oh, yeah. We have four adventurous, hard-working, ambitious cooks. Now it's their day of reckoning, because we are looking for our final three. Welcome to finals week, and very well done, all four of you. We are going to hit you with two incredibly challenging tests. At the end of this, one of you will be leaving us, but of course we will have our final three. We start with a fantastic challenge. That is to create your interpretation of an afternoon tea. We want from you two savouries and two sweet items. And they need to be precise and they need to be beautiful. Two hours, afternoon tea. Let's cook. Afternoon tea is a fantastic challenge because you can be as wild and as creative as you want. It's about presentation, sophistication, and it's about flavour. The biggest thing that can go wrong is just you've got four elements to do. I'm a terrible multitasker. I mean, terrible. I hate it. But there's no other option but to, to multitask today. What's the best memory of afternoon tea you've ever had? So in London 2012, after the Olympics and Paralympics, the Queen invited all the athletes that had won medals uh, for an afternoon tea at Buckingham Palace. <laughs> and so that kind of oh, set, set the bar pretty high. Did they put on a decent spread? The spread was amazing. The other thing I really remember is they had these little tiny chocolates that were filled with honey that was made from bees that were on top of, on top of the castle. No way. Yeah. What have you got that's going to wow us? I am making a yeasted blini with a creamy horseradish prawn filling. And for my savory, I'm making a cheese and sage scone with bacon jam. Uh-huh. And then for my bakes, I'm doing a strawberry basil cupcake with vanilla cream cheese frosting. And I'm also doing a chocolate and chai spice filled pastry. As in chai Chocolate tea. Chocolate chai. In the shape of a horn. It's different, and I'm looking forward to it. Cool. Stephanie's ideas, I think, are really interesting. Stuff up could be fantastic. Strawberry and basil cupcake? Mmm, the jury's out. Thirty minutes gone. Afternoon tea is very, very big in the Partridge household and always has been. And every time you come to the kitchen, you have to do well. So that's what I'm hoping to do today. Smash it. John. Your most memorable dishes for me have been a TV dinner and a, and a cheese pie. Mm -hmm. 
this no, seem, good, seems a lot posher. I'm not really going posh today either. I'm doing a little quiche Lorraine. Pretty classic, I'd say. Smoked trout and cream cheese rollato. What's, what's a volato? No, rotolo. It's just a wrap. I'm doing your fruit scone with your clotted cream and your strawberry jam, and I'm doing your coconut lime and chocolate macaroon. Why so classic? You always used to love going for cream tea every mothering Sunday, every birthday, every Easter, and they're just the, the classic combinations, and it's what I'd expect to see if I went for a cream tea. Nothing wrong with classic as long as it's done brilliantly. I gotcha. Quiche Lorraine is one of those classics that sometimes gets a bad name because it's so badly prepared. It is bacon and egg pie. That pastry has to be thin, cooked all the way through, including the bottom. John knows exactly what's at stake with this challenge. He knows he's got to get it absolutely right. Guys, you've got less than an hour. In fact, you've got 55 minutes. What is your afternoon tea, Marty? So I've done scones. They're already done. They're sat there. Good. Um, and they, I'm making a jam, and they'll have clotted cream. I'm revisiting my scotch eggs after my rugby ball size scotch <laughs> egg. <laughs> Fry up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I'm going back to a scotch egg. So I'm doing uh, venison and pork meat scotch eggs, quail eggs, with a pickled walnut puree. Whoa. And I'm doing um, a blackberry frangipan tart. They're in there already. And I'm making bread. The dough is proving in there. And so I'm making a granary bread, make little rolls, do an open sandwich with some horseradish, pickled cucumber, and some hot smoked salmon. This is going to be your first time you, you're going to try something Ooh, yeah. sweet and elegant. Sweet. Can you do dainty? And is your dainty different to everybody else's? Oh, yeah. Just scale up dainty. <laughs> so that... whatever you think's dainty, scale it up a little bit, and that's my dainty. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Martin is making sure that he's doing everything he possibly can to deliver. We've got a little tiny frangipan tart and blackberries inside. I hope the blackberries don't explode too much and make the frangipan wet or the base of the tart go soggy. And then the scotch egg. Will it really be this big or will it really be this big? My practice, some was good. I could have used the scones as an offensive weapon. Basically, I created small cannonballs. So let us see what happens today. Half an hour. A cucumber sandwich isn't really going to cut it. So I've done some, some kind of fairly savage twists on things in the hope that they're going to say, wow, Spencer, you're so creative and clever. You know, I'm going to steal the idea. You look really stressed. Why? A silly question, right? I purposely gave myself a, a massive mountain to climb. Uh, this, for me, is a big challenge. Uh, I've got a lot of different components going on. Well, everyone does, but I've tried to elevate mine as much as possible and be as creative as possible, really. What are you making? A tiramisu eclair, a uh, Isle of Mull cheddar and crunchy bacon scone, an open mackerel two ways sandwich, a smoked mackerel pate, and uh, I'm curing some fresh filleted mackerel uh, to go on top and blowtorch the skin. And a banana and parsnip cake. Tropical fruit with the most northern of European root veggies. Well, there you go. Spencer, you are either a genius or something else. All right, let's hope for the, the, for the first one. There's pushing the boundaries and there's pushing the boundaries. Really interesting afternoon tea. He's got to make scones. He's got to make shoe pastry. He's got to make bread. He's got to make all sorts of dips and spreads and mixtures all across the top. 
I'm aghast with Spencer's ambition. I hope he pulls it off, because it's putting a massive smile on my face. You've got ten minutes, then it's tea time. Five minutes. Crikey. Final touches. Your time is well and truly up. Well done. Woo. <laughs> wow. Oh, well done, mate. Oh. I didn't even look up. Well done. Wow, that looks amazing. Well done. <laughs> I thought afternoon tea was meant to be dainty and refined and elegant. <laughs> yes, it is, isn't it? Well, the whole process of it. Mm, that was, like, amazing. Well done. Thank you very much indeed for, for your hard work and your fantastic-looking creations. Because this is finals week, we've invited a very special guest. Can I introduce you to arguably one of the best pastry chefs in the country? Very talented, an incredibly nice guy. Ladies and gentlemen, Eric Landlard. Friends. <laughs> Hello, Eric. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Cup of tea? Yeah, why not? After serving as a chef in the French Navy, Eric Landlard came to Britain to work in pastry for the Roux brothers. I've always been attracted to uh, pastries because, first of all, I like the uh, artistic flair behind it. And at the same time, I like how you have to be precise and uh, follow the strict rules behind it. It's not really cooking, it's more chemistry. His London patisserie has created cakes for the Beckhams, the Queen Mother and Madonna, and his bespoke afternoon teas are highly sought after. You do adapt to uh, pinch yourself and sometimes do a little dance in the office when you get a phone call coming from someone like Madonna or Buckingham Palace. You always go like, wow, this is uh, incredible. I love afternoon tea. I love everything about afternoon tea. Forget lunch, forget dinner. I want to see something who visually look great. The savory, the sweet, and of course, the scones make it different uh, on entertaining. I'm not a great fan of finger sandwiches, and I still don't understand after 30 years why will you stick cucumber into white bread. Martin, up you come. Dutch eggs with pickled black walnut relish, blackberry and almond frangipan tarts, and scones with strawberry jam and clotted cream. It looked great, very interesting, different, uh, kind of colourful. I love a good scotch eggs, and I think those are great and great size. I think the walnut um, sauce, like you call it, would have been better if it had been a bit thicker. But the blackberry tart, very nice pastry, very crispy. I could have done with a little bit more blackberry inside, but the frangipan is spot on, really nice, very soft, very tasty, not overpowering. And I love the horseradish with the hot smoked salmon, very tasty, very powerful. And man, can I just say something? If you're going to put a cucumber into the sandwich, that's the way you do it. You pickle it. Tasty. 
There's little bits of finesse, which I'm really admiring. Your frangipan tart, your pastry is really, really fine. Uh, your scones are light and fluffy, but your jam is lovely and sticky and still holding on to it. I don't have any complaint at all. Great, right, thank you. Martin, this is great work. Thank you. This is really, really good work. Big man, you've done brilliantly well. Oh, I'm yeah. thrilled. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. Thank you very much. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Well done. Well done. Lovely. Oh, that was good, wasn't it? That was good, yeah. Yeah, it's fantastic. I'm glad they enjoyed it. I'm glad they enjoyed it. There's a lot to it, isn't there? It's very dainty, very fiddly, but a lot of fun. When it all comes together, it's good fun. <laughs> Stephanie, please. Stephanie has made blinis, or pancakes, with creamy dill and horseradish prawns, cheddar and sage scones with bacon jam, strawberry basil cupcakes with vanilla buttercream icing, and chocolate-dipped puff pastry horns filled with chocolate chai, or spiced tea, whipped cream. The presentation is really good. I really like it. It's very pretty. Very, very pretty. Whoa, look at that. Oh. Well, I'm happy. I love the blini, starting with the savoury. That blini is so fluffy, and I love the prawns on the, on the top as well. Cheese cone, really good, very cheesy, and I love the bacon inside, but I would have probably done them a little bit bigger. OK. The, the horn, I love that chocolate tasting of chai. That, that is lovely. I mean, I like a chai tea latte, so that, to me, is a real, real treat. That I love. I think you're, you're being very daring with your combinations, basil and strawberry cupcakes. So the cake itself is almost savoury with basil, but that cream cheese topping, which I think is absolutely fantastic, is really sweet, so is the strawberry jam. I really, really like that. Stephanie, thank you very much. I'm on a bit of a high. Um, today was encouraging because I just feel like, you know, they've seen the hard work. It's not perfect, but we are moving closer to, you know, professional standard, hopefully. <laughs> Got a plate each, right? A plate each, yes. Spencer has made an open sandwich of smoked mackerel pate, cured mackerel, horseradish creme fraiche, pickled cucumber and pea shoots. Cheddar, lemon thyme and bacon scones served with whipped goat's cheese, tiramisu chocolate eclairs and parsnip and banana cake topped with cream cheese frosting. Very impressed when in two hours you managed to do all that. Did you make the bread as well? I did, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, two hours making shoe pastry, bread, scones, everything. The scones is more, more biscuity than, uh, than a scone, and I think looking at the base of yours, it could have done with um, a bit more baking or something. You look a bit uh, raw in the middle. Parsnip and banana, and yes, I've got the, the, the strength. There's nothing subtle about a parsnip or a banana. I mean, they're sweet, that's lovely. With that cheesy icing across the top, that's lovely. That chocolate coffee tiramisu eclair, that's yummy. I mean, I, I would happily have a bucket full of that. It looks slightly flat, but that shoe pastry is perfect. Love the bread, love the fact you made the horseradish. The mackerel pate across the top, really good. You didn't need the cured mackerel. And if you're going to cure a piece of mackerel, take the skin away. OK. Because the skin's really tough and flabby and you can never, ever eat it. Your sweet things, fantastic. Savoury things, not so. I think you probably attempted a little bit too much here, Spencer. Despite the comments not being the best I've ever had, I couldn't have been more in the zone. So, to be honest, I'm happy with that. Serious. <laughs> John's afternoon tea consists of smoked trout, lemon, dill, and cream cheese rotolos or wraps, mini quiche lorraines, fruit scones with strawberry jam and clotted cream, and chocolate coconut and lime macaroons. I like the presentation, I like the stand. It's cool, it's, uh, it's fun, uh, it's interesting.
There's macaroons with the, with the lime and the coconut. I mean, tropical flavours, just, just lovely. My only complaint is, is the chocolate not set on, the, on this macaroon. Apart from that, everything else is lovely. Your little flatbread with smoked trout, lemon and dill. Bread's made really, really nicely. Nothing to complain about at all. The scones are a bit too big, but the great news is they're lovely and fluffy and they're delicious. I'm going to be a bit picky about the quiche Lorraine, and I would have loved the pastry to be a little bit more crusty, okay. uh, crunchy underneath. I thought Eric's comments were fair. Firm, but fair. Not like the bottom of my quiche, unfortunately. Oh, you should be really proud. You four should be really, really proud. What I do want you to reflect upon is how much you have able to achieve in that short period of time. Thank you very much. Off you go. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very impressed. It's been two hours to create all of that. All very different as well. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you Thank very you. much. Cheers, Thank Eric. You. See Thank you later. You. See you soon. Thank you. A really strong round. Our four continue to grow. It is the start of finals week. And now they've got one more tough test to keep their place in the competition. John, if that is the taste of the finals, bring it on. It's a good old fashioned pressure day and it has to be right. That one slip up can start a whole avalanche of cooking disaster. I have a really clear idea of what I want to produce. So I just want to go in and attack and get as close to that vision as I possibly can. Head down, work hard, keep tasting, make sure everything's delicious, and have fun. Getting into the final would be, uh, would be the icing on the cake. How would I do that icing? Let's think. Mm, no idea. Today is a tough challenge because you are going to have to present your food to three highly respected restaurant critics. That's Tracy McLeod, William Sitwell, and Grace Dent. What we expect is real style and extraordinary skill with delicious food. At the end of this, sadly, one of you is going to leave the competition. Ladies and gentlemen, you've got two courses, four plates of each course, one hour and 30 minutes. Let's cook. She does great flavour, Stephanie. It's different and it can be spectacular. They can also divide the crowd. She's going to draw on that creative and a little bit interesting to truly impress. I, I really, I don't even want to think that I'm cooking for food critics. It's terrifying. So I'm, I'm just going to not think about it. Stephanie, what are your two courses? Um, so for my main, I'm doing beef fillet, and it's going to be marinated in a tiger sauce inspired marinade. What's a tiger sauce? Sorry, it's called tiger milk. You're going to have coriander, ginger. Um, I put garlic in mine, and I've got some jalapeno for a little bit of heat. And some lime, yeah, there's some lime. Lots of lime. Lots of lime, yes. And then with that, I'm going to do some chipotle corn and a cucumber salad. When I first got married, which is also when I first kind of started cooking, um, my husband's living in Dallas. So there just naturally was a lot of Tex-Mex and South American-inspired food, flavors that I really, really love. What's pudding? Coconut panna cotta uh, infused with some lemongrass and a little bit of ginger, and it's going to come with a macadamia nut crumble and a mango compote. Compote? Compote. <laughs> compote. No, no, you're mixing me up. <laughs> A fillet of beef which has been seared first off and then put in a marinade which has got lots and lots of lime juice, lots and lots of coriander, and is very strong as used for curing seafood. Beef flavoured with lime? I'm dubious, John, to say the least. 
Stephanie's dessert. She's got to get that panna cotta absolutely right. The temptation is to put too much gelatin in because you're desperate for it to set. If you do that, it's too hard. John always cooks ground pleasers but makes them refined. He elevates them into something truly special. And that's what this is all about. John puts his heart and soul into his dishes. He's passionate about his food. You can't come this far and not have your eye on the prize. You can't. I'd love to get to the final, and I have that chance. Just me saying that, I can instantly feel nauseous. <laughs> Two courses. Explain to us what you're going to cook. My first course, I'm going to do a uh, crispy hen's egg. Serve that with uh, some asparagus tips, just char-grilled, a bit of lemon, and I'm going to do a hollandaise with that. And then fillet of beef, Jerusalem artichoke uh, gratin, and I'm serving that on a Swiss chard with a simple pan -jus. Of all the courses you could have done, why these two? Well, this is something that I like to eat. Essentially, it's meat and two veg. What I'm trying to do is put my heart and soul on a plate, and I hope you like it. And if you don't, I've enjoyed doing it. Hollandaise and asparagus are an absolute classic. I love asparagus, but John is charguillier, and I think that might be a mistake. I don't want crunchy asparagus with hollandaise. Beef, and I'm hoping an absolutely fantastic Jerusalem artichoke gratin. All that earthiness, that nuttiness. I love it. When Spencer is calm, then he is on song, and that's what he's going to do today. Not too much to do, just great clarity. My dishes today are a roast loin of venison with a carrot and star anise puree, wilted cavolo nero, and a green peppercorn sauce, and let's not forget the salt baked beetroot. And then for pudding, we've got a Caribbean Pineapple souffle with a coconut and lime sorbet with a rum caramel sauce. Very tropical. Bits of my menu concern me, but I'm a risk taker. Gotta do it. Have you tried a pineapple souffle before? Uh, I recently tried one, yes. It, it rose up okay? Yes. Maybe it was first, first, first time luck. Beginner's luck. Can you honestly get this done, Spencer? I think so. I'm just missing the tan. But otherwise, I'm on a beach right now. Spencer's always has given himself a huge amount of work to do. The venison has to be cooked absolutely perfectly. The sauce has got to be really, really rich. And the souffle has to rise. He's honestly going to do four souffles. I mean, that's, that, that's too much pressure. Martin right now is combining skillful process with very, very good flavours. John, that's all you need to do to impress those critics. Cooking for, for guests is crazy. The pressure just ramps up. And you've got to be nice to them, haven't you? You've got to smile. You can't just storm in there, throw it out and say, eat that. <laughs> that that's frowned upon. Big day, Martin? It is a big day, isn't it? Yeah, pressure's on. When you played out there in front of 80,000 people in a, in a stadium, what had to go through your mind to make sure you could focus? I would always concentrate on the first 10 minutes of the game. Start well. And that's what you've done this one? I think so. I think so. What are you cooking <laughs> for us? OK, I'm doing... Uh, Cod with a seafood ragu, uh, with a hollandaise sauce, a chive oil sauce, right. and some uh, seaweed, crumbed seaweed. And then, because it's fish and hopefully not too heavy, we can wade in big on the dessert. Which is? Which is a malted chocolate torte with a 
a malt foam and roasted hazelnuts. You are going more and more French and classic with your cooking. Is that what you want to do? Is that what you aspire to? No, I just I want to cook fish. Fish has always been a tricky one. Love the idea of, of shellfish in there as well. Sharp, fresh flavours on the plate, that's what I'm after. I know you're good. Are you good enough? Yeah. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> good luck. Thank you. Martin's out to show his technical know-how, but these are classically very difficult dishes. Hollandaise sauce, cooking the cod properly. However, could be fantastic. Then we've got a malt chocolate tot with a malt foam at the end. Yes! Brown and sticky. That's my sort of greggy fat boy heaven. Bring it on. I'm always thrilled to be in the MasterChef studios. A bit apprehensive when it's the celebrities, but what often happens is one of the people can really cook. That's the exciting thing, it's finding that talent. On Celebrity MasterChef, the contestants often try and do too much, and that can be absolutely disastrous. Actually, as a nice, decent human being, I want it to go right. I don't want to see bland, media-trained type of food. I want to see food that really tells me about the person. Steph is cooking tiger milk marinated beef fillet. There's not many people who come onto Celebrity MasterChef and bring something Peruvian, yeah, it feels quite risky, doesn't it? Two and a half minutes, Stephanie. I think the key thing is the tenderness of that beef. It's got to be tender, it's got to be fantastic. Wallop, there we go. Nice looking meat. You need to be serving now, please, Stephanie. OK, let's go. Very good looking dish, off you go. Thank you. That's for you. Thanks. Stephanie has cooked tiger's milk marinated beef fillet, crunchy chipotle sweet corn and compressed cucumber salad, charred baby corn, served with a tiger's milk marinade dressing. That beef, the marinade has given it a really fantastic kind of crust to it, which is almost sort of caramelised. You can get the citrus from it. You're, you're getting real character from that beef. What I really like is the little bits of crunchy, charred corn. So, actually, there's some quite nice textures that are, are going on here. The compressed cucumber salad was absolutely delightful. The beef fillet, I like. It's been cooked well. The sweet corn texture is good. I like the crunch of the cucumber. I, I admire the inventiveness. I like the cookery skill. But, John, you know, that's, that's a highly unusual array of flavours. 20 minutes for dessert, right? I know, I've got to make sure it's not burning, though. Panna cottas, mangoes, crumbles, oh, yeah. It's a hard thing to do. We've eaten many panna cottas on this show. So when a celebrity turns up with theirs, they've really got to get it right. Coconut is sort of gritty, it's bitty. I don't want to get a mouthful of toenail pairings in my panna cotta, you know what I mean? Look at that wobble. Oh! starting to collapse on you. I know. Yeah, they are. The weight that they are, uh-oh. Can we have less mango? What about a little bud rather than one full in flower? The mango compote 
needs to be not too tart and it needs to be not too sweet and that is the thing that will drag the whole dish together. You okay? No, oh, it's not how I wanted, but it is what it is. Okay, let's go, let's go. For dessert, I have made for you a coconut panna cotta infused with lemongrass, ginger, and kefir lime leaves, a macadamia nut and coconut crumble, and some mango compote. Please enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Mine certainly doesn't look as perky as yours. In fact, mine looks like it may have been dropped. Um, but there's also something slightly off-putting about the colour of this panna cotta. It's kind of greyish. Not a very um, appetising colour, really, is it? Oh. What's that? The thing is that it actually tastes like uh, wallpaper paste or ectoplasm. That's how I imagine <laughs> it would taste. There's something just not right about this. The sweetness, the mango compote, you've got some crunch from the nut crumble, but it's gone completely wrong. There's this strange coconut solidified mass of mm. fatty nastiness. I'm afraid it hasn't been particularly well executed. It's a shame. The crumble's lovely. The, the mango puree is absolutely delicious, but the panna cotta is not a panna cotta and it's separated. We're losing the coconut sweetness and the creaminess. Ooh, John, we've got problems. We've got big problems. Oh, split panna cotta isn't ideal, but do you know what? I just, I did my best. I mean, I just worked every second that I had, and, um, you know, I just, I just need to accept that it wasn't perfect. So, John, crispy fried hen's egg, served with asparagus, and hollandaise sauce. This is all very beautifully worded, but it's just asparagus with a dippy egg. That hollandaise is hard to get right. It's got to have that lovely, foamy consistency. John, you, you've got two minutes. Are we going to get it out? I think we are. Come on, you little beauty. I'm not sure why it's not thickening. Hold your nerves, it's fine. I'm not sure about that. Here it comes. Epic! Classic beauty. Thanks, guys. Thank you. So today you have crispy hen's egg and asparagus with a bit of hollandaise. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. To me, this is a breath of lovely fresh air. It looks fantastic. The finesse of the dish comes at the expense of several things not being quite right. You know, the asparagus is undercooked, the hollandaise sauce is not buttery and creamy enough. The scotch egg is not quite runny enough. With sort of 5% more care, it would have been absolutely brilliant. It could be served in a quite good gastro pub, and you would maybe think the chef was just having a slightly off day. The hollandaise isn't thick enough. And it's not got enough citrus. The big problem here is this. That asparagus is not cooked. It's a shame, because it could have been a really lovely dish. 20 minutes. Sounds good. Good. John, for his main, is making the fillet with Jerusalem artichoke gratin and rainbow chard and a beef reduction. It's Sunday roast, really. 
the beef fillet had better be good because I wouldn't travel very far to eat a Jerusalem artichoke gratin. Happy with that? I'm very happy with that. Looks great. As soon as you can get your jus on, you can go. Go get them. Well done. Well done. Simplistic beauty, John. Very nice. Thank you. Why did I choose such large plates? <laughs> We have fillet of beef with a Jerusalem artichoke gratin, some Swiss chard, and a wee bit of jus. Enjoy. Thanks a lot. John does know how to plate food. This could be very plain, but actually, there's a rather nice artistic simplicity about it. My beef was cooked beautifully. I love out of everything, the gratin, it, it's beautiful. It changes how you feel about that vegetable, and that's, and that's skill. It's beautiful. It's a real innovation. The chard is, is really lovely, and it's got that wonderful sort of earthy green flavour. The jus is really nice, deep. I think it's great. Overall, it's a well-balanced, generously proportioned dish. He seasoned that piece of beautifully cooked beef brilliantly. He's put a little bit of truffle in the jus as well, which is just honest, proper, proper yum grub. I love the gratin, salty parmesan across the top, which seasons the rest of the dish. If there was a problem with John Starter, well, he's made up for it with his main course. <sighs> My starter was weak. And I think both dishes have to sing. So I just don't know. I really don't know. Wow. Spencer, he's got an entire kitchen brigade in his head. He's on sauce. He's roasting his venison. He's baking his beetroot. Let's hope that it works for him, because there's so much going on. It's going to be a signature smear, isn't it? Come on, son. Do it. Oh, yeah. At the heart of it, he's got to get that venison right. You happy, Spencer? Yeah, it's fine. Still got that nice pinkness to it. Cavalier Nero, pass it to go. Almost there. Almost there. Very, very well done. Go on, son. Off you go. Oh, good shoe. Did you work as a waiter? I did. Hi. Hello. Good afternoon. Hello. Hi. I have some venison for you. Great, thank you. No problem. Thank you. Spencer is serving roast loin of venison, carrot and star anise puree, pickled parsnips, wilted cavalonero, salt baked baby beetroot and a green peppercorn sauce. He's thrown everything at the plate. There's about seven ingredients, too many. The venison is pretty decent. It's got good texture. I think it's got quite a lot of flavour there, especially when you put the gravy over it. But there's no finesse, there's no sophistication. The parsnip, doesn't taste of anything. The is it cavalonero is undercooked. The star anise carrot um, splodge was actually quite tasty, but it was thrown at the plate like a, you know, like it's like a nursery painting. The peppercorns are all over the place, so when you took a mouthful of everything, you'd get a crunchy peppercorn, which was a bit too much. But there's a generosity about it, though, isn't there? There's a sort of a warmth and an enthusiasm and a desire to please us, which, you know, even though he hasn't really managed to do so, you know, I applaud. The issue we have is that that venison is overcooked and going dry, and that's real shame. It's not perfect, and the reason it's not perfect is I think it's a little bit too much to do again.
Spencer's giving us pineapple souffle served with a coconut and lime sorbet and a rum caramel sauce, which sounds like all his Caribbean holidays have come at once, doesn't it? It can either be the most wonderful thing in the world and he'll walk away victorious, or that's it, game over. How's your souffles? Are they rising to the occasion? They are. Yes, 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 yes. Souffles are rising. They look great, Spencer. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Hey. Whoa. Oh, my word. Look at that. Go. 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 Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you. No, 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 no. Be proud. Give him a big smile. Look at that. Hello. Hello. Your souffle. Great. It's still up. Yes. We have a pineapple souffle with coconut and lime sorbet with a rum caramel sauce. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. He's brought out a perfect looking souffle. This is lovely. I'm very happy. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Blimey. That was as perfect and as beautiful a souffle as you might ever wish to have. Yes, it had risen, but the, the lightness of it, I mean, it is seriously bang on perfect, incredible. That was like a religious experience. <laughs> <laughs> It's a beautiful sorbet. It's just gorgeous. When do I ever finish MasterChef puddings? Look at me. I'm helpless. What really makes the whole thing work and pulls everything together is that rum caramel sauce. Buttery, sweet, caramel. Oh, my goodness, it's good. Oh, superb. Souffle, beautifully light and just hints of pineapple with every mouthful. But the one that just really gets me is that lime and coconut sorbet. That is out of this world. When you put it all together, you've got like a cocktail of dreams. Mm. That's fantastic. That, we've done it now. There's, there's no turning back. I would, do, I would do my venison differently if I could, but I can't. I think the souffle was fantastic. I, can't, I couldn't have made a better souffle, I don't think. So I'm happy with that. So Martin's made a roasted cod with a shellfish ragu served with hollandaise, seaweed powder, and a shellfish sauce. This man loves the sea. Martin is trying to impress us. He's trying to impress idiots like me who've never heard of a gretti. I think, actually, it's some kind of Italian veg. The only thing that matters is can he cook a piece of fish where it's just perfect. Is it beautiful, Martin? It'll do. Mate, that looks like a restaurant dish. Let's <laughs> hope it tastes Gone. like a restaurant dish. Let's hope it tastes like one. Please excuse the view as I come through the door. <laughs> Martin has cooked roasted cod on a bed of shellfish ragu topped with a gretti, an Italian coastal vegetable, served with hollandaise, seaweed powder and a chive oil sauce. It's a remarkably delicate plate from such a huge guy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this, this is the nicest plate I've seen so far today. that cod. It's so perfectly cooked. It's as pillowy and succulent, almost as scallops. I'm disappointed with the agretti because it just felt like parsley. You know, it's just it, no one would notice if it was there or not. He's great with his sauce. It's so perfect. His seaweed dust is, is clever, but the potatoes maybe could have been cooked for a tiny bit longer. 
The thing is, it looks like it should be absolutely perfect, and there are little things that aren't quite right. That cod is flaky and falling apart, but the potatoes aren't cooked at all, and the other one is the razor clams are overcooked and they're going a little bit chewy. Right. You know you've got 20 minutes now? Yeah. Pudding yeah. time. Chocolate tort can be lovely. I hope it's lovely and chocolatey. Roasted hazelnuts, nice bit of crunch, fairly classic. I despise foams, but, you know, I love the taste of malt. So maybe that'll bring it back. So pastry on the bottom and then, like, a chalky mousse-type baked thing. Yeah. But then molten the... in the middle. Well, I don't think it's going to be molten. Okay. That's going to have to be it, I'm afraid, chaps. My work here is done. <laughs> Don't cry over spilt foam. Go on, mate. <laughs> Go on. It's all right. Thank you. Thank you. So, we've got a uh, chocolate malt tort with roasted hazelnuts and a rather disappointing malt sauce. It was meant to foam, it didn't foam, so it's a sauce. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. The fact that his foam has failed is just a bonus for me, because what we've got instead now is a lovely, sticky, uh, malty sauce and a gorgeous uh, chocolate torte, which I, I can just see this is great. Martin's mistakes are better than most people's triumphs, aren't they, on the basis of this? Sure, the foam hasn't worked, but it's sort of melted down into a lovely sort of toffee-ish puddle, like melted ice cream. And that tort has got a wonderful texture. It's not too deeply chocolatey, and I think that lends it kind of really interesting sophistication. I love the crunch of the bottom. I love his failed malt foam. I love the grated hazelnut. Perfect. The chocolate and malt is, is deep and it, it, it's, it's slightly bitter and it's really rich, but it's very cloyey. I, I need some cream on there just to break down that richness. 14 years of MasterChef and you don't like something that's sticky and brown? What is wrong with you? I think it's great. My malt foam didn't foam. I was in a foam-free zone. No foams allowed. <laughs> So that's disappointing because it completely changes the look of the dish. But do you know what? That's the way it is. It was always going to be a tough round. There was some amazing food. Before we go any further, let me just praise Spencer's souffle. Because that souffle was a stunner. And a stunner not just for you and I, but our three critics as well were enamoured by it. However, we weren't absolutely convinced by Spencer's main course. The venison was overcooked. We all were united in praise for John's beef and that beautiful Jerusalem artichoke gratin. But his first course mm. had issues. The asparagus should have been cooked more. The hollandaise needed more lemon in it. I've enjoyed Stephanie's different flavours for, for quite a while now and I thought that was a very bold move. That lovely piece of beef with coriander and lime, the critics liked it. However, Stephanie's dessert was a disaster. Martin's cod dish, I thought, looked fantastic, and he cooked that cod perfectly. Then the dessert comes, and it separates you and I. Usually I'm the one who has the issue with desserts, but today it was you. All four of them had different issues. You can't look out there and say one of those four is a bad cook. You can't. However, we need to find a final three. One has to go. I, like, really, really want to go through. If I, like, write to my MP, do you think it will happen? Do you think there's anything that my MP can do for me right now? You know, you have to earn your place. And, um, you know, at this stage, there, there really can't be mistakes. But I am proud, and I did the absolute best that I could. I just don't quite think it was good enough. But it is a waiting game, so I shall wait. I like taking risks, and I took a big risk, and I hope it pays off. 
I would love the souffle to save me. <laughs> I want to tell you that the competition so far, the stand has been amazing. And that is because of you. And you should be really, really, really proud of what you've done so far. So thank you very, very much indeed, all four of you. I'm sad to say that one of you is leaving the competition. The contestant leaving us. Is Steph. Stephanie, great competition. Thank you very much indeed. You're a superstar, <laughs> superhuman. I'm disappointed, but I will look back on the MasterChef experience and, and just, just smile. I mean, it's just, it's like nothing else in life that I've ever done. I'm just really thankful that I was a part of it. Gentlemen, congratulations. You are final three. <laughs> Fantastic. I knew it! I knew it! Ah! The fact that I've actually managed to get here, I've managed to hang on, feels... It just feels absolutely fantastic. I'd absolutely resigned myself to the fact that I was packing my bags and going. I never, ever imagined I'd be in the final three. I am absolutely overjoyed. The dream is slowly but surely still happening, so I couldn't be happier. Next time, it's the Celebrity Master Chef final. Ah! Ready for war. Feel the temperature starting to rise. The three finalists face two daunting challenges. Absolutely lovely. Impressing some of the country's leading chefs. This is the part of the competition that can make or break our contestants. Before cooking their final three courses. It's awesome. At the end, only one can be crowned Celebrity MasterChef Champion 2018.